Hello, this is Camille Fairborn from Michigan State University, and I'd like to welcome you to today's cause teaching and learning webinar. We're pleased to have as our presenter today, Dr. Albert Kim, who is currently a lecturer of statistics at Amherst College, but is about to take up the title of Assistant Professor of Statistical and Data Sciences at Smith, Smith College. For today's webinar, he will give a presentation entitled Tame Data Principles and the 538R Package. The way the webinars work is that all listeners are muted during the webinar. You can ask questions at any time by typing them into the questions box. We'll be sure to ask those questions towards the end and give the presenter a chance to respond. You can also use the chat box if you are having any technical questions. At this point, I'll turn things over to Dr. Kim. Albert, go ahead. Oops, great. Thank you very much, Camille. So uh, welcome to my webinar. So today's focus is going to be a little bit narrow. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what data uh, we can use in introductory statistics and data science courses. So uh, ideally, in my opinion, I'd like to use data that is uh, rich enough to answer meaningful questions with, uh, real enough to ensure that there's context, but also realistic enough to convey to uh, the reality of much of the world's, uh, the real nature of much of the world's data. This is going to be a focus of today's webinar. So on the one hand, uh, one goal that I set for myself when using data in courses is one uh, argued by Cobb in 2015 in a uh, the American Statistician article, where he argues that we should, one, uh, teach through research. So instead of having students learn and then do, have students do and learn by doing. To that end, he argues that we should minimize prerequisites to research. Now, not necessarily research, meaning research as in publishing in top-notch journals, but something as simple as answering questions with data. And the more barriers we put to this, especially early on in the course, uh, the more we, uh, the higher probability we have of losing student engagement. So that is one goal on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, uh, there's another goal that uh, I'd like to achieve is to convey the true nature of data as it exists in much of the world. So for example, there was a New York Times article on uh, August 17, 2014, talking about quote unquote data janitor work. Now, I find that term a little bit uh, pejorative, but I think what they're implying is that a lot of the world's data is very, very messy, is very, very uh, needs cleaning, needs wrangling, uh, and transformation to be brought to a form in order uh, that we're, we can use to extract insight from. Uh, Jenny Bryan, Professor Jenny Bryan at UBC uses the following analogy. She compares uh, classroom data as teddy bears and real world data like a grizzly bear with salmon blood dripping out of its mouth. That's an analogy that I particularly enjoy. So we see here, looking at those two goals, actually they conflict with one another. On the one hand, you wanna minimize prerequisites to research and may give students data that is easily accessible so that they can get going answering questions quick. But on the other hand, you don't want to betray the reality of data as it exists in much of the world. So these goals actually conflict with each other. So if you go back to the analogy, uh, a balancing act is required. On the one hand, like I said, uh, like Cobb said, we would like to minimize prerequisites to research or have, provide students with data that does not need any prerequisites, in particular computation and data wrangling skills, which you can compare to a teddy bear, versus data as it exists in the wild, and you have that wild grizzly bear on the right. Now, presenting students with either extremes may not be appropriate. Students will not be equipped to handle data as it is in the wild on the right, but on the other hand, we might be doing students a disservice by shielding them too much from data as it exists in the real world by following a model on the left. This is where this idea uh, of data taming uh, <coughs> is expressed. 
So what data taming attempts to do is set a balance between these two goals. On the one hand, we want to perform just enough pre-processing so that data is accessible to our novices. But on the other hand, we don't want to perform so much data pre-processing so as to betray the reality of data as it exists in the wild. So again, this is all about a balancing act between the two. We want to do a little pre-processing, but not too much. So these are the uh, overarching philosophies of data taming. Let's get explicit. So we propose the following tame data principles to remove the biggest hurdles that our novices faced. So uh, this is based on the experience of myself, uh, Chester Ismay of DataCamp, and uh, Jennifer Chun, who now works at Nordstrom. At the time of the creation of the 538 package, which I'll discuss momentarily, we were all instructors. And we found that these were among the biggest barriers that uh, new R users faced. Now, if you want an explicit artic uh, articulation of these principles, I'll give you a link to an article in Technological Innovation Statistics but here is a brief uh, paraphrasing of them. On the number one, you want to provide students with data that have clean variable names. Number two, any variables that are identification variables used to ID uniquely identify the different observations or rows should be on the left-hand side. Number three, dates. Dates should be pre-processed and formatted in a manner such that they can be easily used to make time series plots. Number four, logically ordered categorical variables. While there have been many advances in simplifying the use of categorical variables in R, this is still something that I find very tricky, and especially for new R users, uh, they have a lot of trouble with. How do you order categorical variables in a logical fashion. And number five, providing data in a consistent, tidy format. I'll define that momentarily, but tidy is akin to long or narrow format of data as opposed to wide format of data. I'll uh, illustrate these momentarily. So in the 538R package, which was co-authored by Chester Ismay and Jennifer Chun, we did the following. In case you're not familiar, 538.com is a data journalism website founded by Nate Silver. They report on social science, economics, politics, polling, and sports. They've been very forward thinking in sharing much of the data corresponding to their articles on github.com. Well, what the 538R package does is that it takes this data and most importantly, pre-processes the raw data so that it follows tame data principles. Then we take this tame data, documentation, and links to the original articles and make it easily accessible in an R package. That way, students can load these data sets using an R package instead of working with uh, comma separated values, spreadsheets, and Excel spreadsheets. So now I'm going to give examples and illustrations of the benefits of data taming for all of the five tame data principles. Now this is a little bit cumbersome in slide format. So this is best viewed in an HTML web page format. I'm going to go over a couple of examples. So you can find these at bit.ly slash causeweb underscore tame. The content is identical to what I'm showing in these slides, but only for the code portions, it's going to be easier to follow along. So again, I'll give you a moment. It is bit.ly slash causeweb underscore tame. Once you've had a chance to go to that web page, you'll see that it's again identical to this talk right here. And uh, go to the left-hand menu and click on principle one 
clean variable names. That is going to be the first example. Great. So all the examples are going to follow this format. We're first going to compare the raw and tame data. So for example, there was an article posted on 538.com discussing a, the results of a survey that showed that 41% of flyers think you're rude if you recline your seat. There is a link also to the raw comma separated value as provided by 538 on github.com. We're gonna first compare and contrast the raw data and the tame data and show the benefits of using tame data, especially in an intro course setting. So first, these few lines of code read the CSV as provided, the raw CSV as provided by 538.com and shows, for example, that some of the variable names are as follows. Do you have any children under 18? In general, is it rude to bring a baby on a plane? Then we have the corresponding data in tamed format included in the flying data frame in the 538R package. These variable names are simplified, and furthermore, there are no spaces. Now you might ask yourself, what is the difference between this form of variable names versus this form of variable names? Well, if you have experience using R, you'll know that use, working with variable names that have spaces can get very messy. So for example, look at this code down here that's going to attempt to create a mosaic plot. Because of the spaces in the variable names, you have to insert these tick marks. Whereas if the variable does not have spaces, you don't have to use tick marks. Now for a new R user, this is gonna be very confusing. So instead, we provide the students with very clean variable names that they can type quickly in order to create mosaic plots. So for example, here's what the, data, the mosaic plot looks like using the raw data and on the right, using the tame data. So for example, we see that for those individuals that do have a baby, a lower proportion of people think that it is very rude to bring a baby on a flight. And similarly, a larger proportion of people than those who don't have a baby think it is not rude. So that is one illustration of clean variable names. Let's go to the second example. Identification variables. This one is more organizational. You want any variables that identify a or distinguish the different rows in a data set to be on the left-hand side because they are in the most prominent spot. So for example, if you look at the biopics data frame, which corresponds to the 538 article about movies on biographies, you'll see that, for example, the variable title and IMDB site tag are on the left. Furthermore, here's another example involving a statistical analysis of the work of Bob Ross, the painter. So for those of you who are fans of the show, The Joy of Painting, we can see, for example, down here, we're gonna select only the first eight columns and show a random sample of three of the episodes. So the episode key is on the left-hand side. Therefore, any variables that identify and allow you to distinguish the rows should be on the left-hand side. Next example, dates. This is a big one. 538 posted an article where they uh, analyzed the behavior or the studied patterns of births occurring on Friday the 13th. That was the original article, and this was the raw CSV data corresponding to that article. Let's load this data and take a look at the first six rows. That's what happens right here. The raw data we see in the corresponding first six rows have year, month, date of month as separate variables. Now, we took this data and we created a new variable. So let's take a look a little bit further down at the tamed data. 
the tamed data version of this raw data now includes an additional variable date, which is simply the concatenation of year, month, date of month, but also saved in date format. So the difference between these two data sets is that we've added a new variable called date. You might ask yourself, why do we care about this? Because making a time series plot using this format of the data above is going to be much more difficult than using this format of the data below. So we can create a time series plot of just using this variable on the x-axis. So let's take all the BRRs that were from 1994 to 2003 and filter for only those BRRs that occurred in 1999 and plot a time series. Because we have access to a variable date, we can easily create time series plots where time is very uh, cleanly presented on the x-axis. For example, we notice that there is a big dip in births occurring just before January 1st, probably most likely due to Christmas, but also there is a large spike occurring a little bit after the beginning of September. I'll give you half a second to guess as to why that might be the case. That spike occurred on September 9th, 1999. In other words, 9999. Parents were inducing births to occur on that particular date because of its very, very funny format of writing it. Great. Principle four, categorical variables. Working with categorical variables is what, in my opinion, one tricky thing about using R and I feel should be left to more intermediate level courses. Let's take a look at this example. The original article was called The Dollar and Cents Case Against the Hollywood's Exclusion of Women. So let's take a look at this. They did an analysis involving something called the Bechdel test. The Bechdel test is a simple metric used to evaluate uh, female representation in movies. We say that a movie passes a Bechdel test if there are at least two female protagonist, uh, named protagonists who speak to each other about something other than a male protagonist. And here is the number of movies that pass that simple metric across time. So for example, in 2010 and 2013, just under 50% of movies pass that metric. Again, there has to be more than two women that speak to each other about something other than a male protagonist. And we see that at no point does that proportion actually exceed 60% for this particular data set. Now notice, there is a hierarchical nature to outcomes of the Bechdel test. In order to have women talk about something of, about other than a male protagonist, there have to be at least two of them that do speak to each other. There is a hierarchical ordering to this variable of Bechdel test. So, if we take the raw data as shared on 538.com and look at the values, they come out as character strings. No talk, okay, no talk, men. When we tame this data, what we did is we save them as factors, meaning that is our representation of categorical variables. But not only that, but we've also placed the ordering of the variables where again, there are no women. There may be two women that do talk. There may be two women who do talk about something other than a male protagonist. And finally at the top, whether or not the movie passes the Bechdel test. Why should we care about this? Because again, if we look at plots involving, for example, this bar plot of that categorical variable, if you use the raw untamed data it lists the various categories or levels 
in alphabetical order. Now this alphabetical order does not correspond to the hierarchical nature of the Bechdel test. But using the Tain data, however, to create this bar plot, we see that now the ordering of the, categor the levels of the categorical variable are now in the logical format. And we see, for example, no women, no talk, men, dubious, and okay. Ordering categorical or reordering a factor in R is something that even I have a little bit of trouble with. And definitely a student in a, or new, R, uh, new users of R are definitely gonna have trouble with. So this is the kind of thing that we feel is best left off to a more intermediate level course. Let's discuss principle five. Tidy data. This is strictly a format used for many packages as input output data frame standardization. In order to have many packages uh, work seamlessly with each other, they standardize the input and output format to follow tidy data format. That is also known as narrow long format. Where each variable must be its own column, each observation must have its, uh, its own row, and each value must have be placed in its own cell. Let's give an illustration of a data set that is tidy and one that is not. So, in this original article, Dear Mona Follow-Up, where do people drink the most beer, wine, and spirits? They shared a data set called drinks.csv. Now, that drinks.csv uh, data set looked something like this. This is not in tidy data format, but this is in wide format. Why? Because the number of servings of beer, spirit, and wine are in separate columns. So what we do in the uh, 538 package is while we leave this data in its original format, we provide the code that allows you to convert this to tidy or narrow long format. And what does this data look like in narrow and long format? It looks like this. Where? Country, Afghanistan, Afghanistan, Afghanistan. And then we have type. We take the columns beer servings, spirit servings, and wine servings and put them and gather them to be the new variable type, and then we count the number of servings. So because there are three values for Afghanistan, three values for Albania, and for all the different countries on earth, this is the format of the data set. Now, while both data sets provide the exact same information, in terms of using functions in R, such as ggplot or base R, they assume a format that is tidy. So for example, using this code, you can make a box plot of world alcohol consumption. So we map the variable type to the x-axis, we map the variable, the number of servings to the y-axis, and we use a geom box plot, meaning the, geomet the geometric representation of this data will be box plots. So for example, we see the number of beer servings, the number of spirit servings, and the number of wine servings. Great. Now, as one final example that is a little bit advanced, so probably not appropriate for an intro level course, but I thought was fascinating nonetheless, is one over here. The original article involved the last 10 weeks of the 2016 uh, uh, presidential election in one handy GIF. The raw data was saved as follows. They have a data uh, for both Clinton and Trump, the date of a particular rally or a campaign event, the location, the latitude and longitude. So what we did when taming this data is first, we ensured that the latitude and longitude were in numerical format, not in degree, minute, second and north, south and east, west format. This is a variation on principle three of having good numerical representation of variables. And finally, we combined both data sets into a single data frame where we added a new variable candidate 
that is either set to Trump or Clinton. So this is the data set over here as included in the 538R package. Why should we care? Because using this particular data set, we can easily create a faceted map. This map shows the difference or the distribution of campaign events for both Clinton and Trump leading up to the 2016 election. So one of the criticisms that Clinton faced uh, in the po electoral postmortem is she did not do campaigning, especially towards the end of the campaign. And as you can see, Trump's distribution has many more points in the battleground states of the Rust Belt. I'm going to go back to the slides now. Comments. An analogy that I heard that I liked is that 538 is like a data petting zoo. Nice tame data that's friendly to new R users. You have to keep in mind, however, that there's no universal balance between those two goals that I mentioned. This balance was going to vary depending on your student's experience, their requirements, and their needs. But careful thought should be, uh, should be put as to what this balance looks like depending on your audience. And also, I would like to point out that this uh, the Tame Data Principles and 538 package can be used in other contexts, including intermediate level data science courses and advanced projects. So here's a brief digression. This can be used in data science courses. So for example, one thing I experimented with is that I, uh, students in my intro course found their own data sets that they had to use for their final projects. Now, as you may know, finding data on the internet can be in wildly different formats. I recruited students in the intermediate level data science course to tame these data sets and make them user friendly for the intro students by giving these tame data principles. If you have any questions about this, feel free to ask me. Next, the source code that we used to convert the raw 538 data to tamed format is available on the 538 uh, R packages GitHub page. So if you look at these three files here, for example, you'll see all the code that we use in order to convert that raw data to tamed data format. So these can be used as exercises in data science, intermediate level data science courses. Unfortunately, uh, I'm exceeding my time limit, so I will skip this next slide here about how it can be used for advanced projects. But again, if you have any questions about this, please do not hesitate to ask. Here are some links to some other resources. There is a link, uh, there is an article to a more complete TISC article in HTML and PDF format. There is a link to the package homepage, including a list of all data sets. And finally, a link to this presentation can be found at bit.ly slash causeweb underscore tame. Thank you very much. Thank you, Albert, for that very interesting webinar. Uh, if you have questions for Albert, go ahead and type them into the question box and I will read those out to him as they appear. Uh, I had a question for you though while we're waiting for other people to type them up. You talked at the beginning of your talk about uh, you know, the teddy bears versus the grizzly bears. I'm wondering what you see in this 538 cleaned up data as still these wild elements that you're, so what wild I've... elements are you leaving for the students in this data? Yes, yes. So I think the prototypical example I use of a data in the wild versus uh, non-wild is not one that's in this data set. I can't think of any specific instances off of my head, but a good example was when students searched for Beyonce, the artist. So for example, in, made a database, in many databases, Beyonce is stored with an E and an accent at the end. But a lot of students will type in Beyonce with an E only at the end. So when they do, for example, a search for Beyonce, uh, they'll find that they don't find Beyonce, and that's because computers cannot distinguish between uh, Beyonce spelt with an E or Beyonce spelt with an E with an accent. 
Another big example is missing data. A lot of these data sets have missing values. So that is another one, a big aspect about data in the real world is that many of the values are missing. So this provides many opportunities to impart lessons on reasons why that data might be missing. Is it missing at random? Is there some systematic reason the data is missing? Those aspects of the data are definitely left intact. Okay, that's good to know. So Gregory Horn is asking, how many semesters before introducing learners to the real world Grizzly data? How many, I mean, in your experience, how long does that take? I think, uh, okay, <laughs> to get to the real world where people can use, uh, can basically tackle any data set they confront in the wild does take probably at least two, or, I would say two or three levels, uh, two or three courses. But I view it more as a gradual rollout. So at first you provide uh, at, an er at an early stage, very, very tame data sets, but then you progressively inc uh, uh, increase the values, uh, increase, increase the complexity. So for example, you might take data that exists, uh, uh, numerical data that exists as, uh, 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 as uh, characters or string data and allow the students themselves to convert this data. Mm -hmm. So to answer that question is a little bit hard. I couldn't give you an exact number, but it really is a question of how much complexity you wanna layer on in subsequent courses. But I found that usually by a third course where students are really got experience working with progressively harder and harder data sets, they've imbued, they're at least imbued with a sense of confidence so that even if they don't know how to tackle a particular data set, they are equipped to do the Google searches and learn the techniques to handle more esoteric data sets, such as those in JSON format or maybe those in shapefile format. That's pretty much what we all do, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much again for this uh, webinar, Dr. Kim, and thank you all for attending today. Our next webinar will be on July 10th at the same time, so I encourage you to keep your eye on CauseWeb or on your email for the registration link and for other webinars coming up during the summer months. Thanks again for being here and have a great day.